your Bible with me this morning, the book of Revelation, second chapter, chapter two, book of Revelation. We're, uh, we're talking about the churches as of now, that's where we're into, and we have pointed out whenever we started this that the churches uh, are kind of in a, not a perfect circle, but you know, the way they're located in geographically, they're in an almost a circle. And you remember reading the verse that uh, Jesus stood in the midst of the churches. Uh, he's in the midst of this church. He's always in the midst of his church wherever it, wherever it might be. And we take, too, by the way, from the fact that he calls them churches, plural, that there's no such thing as a universal church as some teach. They're all independent of each other. They all have the one head, the head is the Lord uh, Jesus Christ, and uh, he's the one that can, is, gives us all of the directions that we need. Uh, we need to listen to him. I'm not the head of this church. I'm the under-shepherd to him. I'm to give you the messages that he gives to me, and hopefully I'll keep them clear that my prayer is always that I don't inject myself into it because it's easy for me to be foolish and say things that's unnecessary and may God help me not to be that way uh, but to just preach his message because every one of these letters in this seven churches that's mentioned there it's a letter written to the pastor of the church to deliver to the congregation and so that as we pointed out before when we first started this that the pastor is in the hand of the Lord and then responsible to the Lord and the church to deliver the message that the Lord gives to him to the congregation. I don't have any new messages. There's no such thing. There's people that claim it. But the Bible is the word of God from Genesis 1-1 to the Revelation 22 end of it, that's all God's word, all the messages that we need and have is lit, written in those pages and they're there for you and me. And the message that we have and we're going through now is pertaining to the church age. The church age has already uh, been almost 2,000 years. Again, a contradiction to what some believe the church started with the Lord Jesus Christ when he was here on the earth. Not after he went to heaven, it wasn't on the day of Pentecost, which is 50 days after his resurrection, uh, 10 days after he ascended, that the Holy Spirit came and baptized the church, empowered it to do the work. If you remember reading Acts 1 verse 8, he said, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And they did. And on that day, the church was baptized with the power of God to do the work of God in the world. And it will not be baptized anymore. It was baptized one time and it does not have to be baptized again. All of God's, all of the Lord's churches start, started, ha, that have been started up to this point, come from that very first church. Just like you and I came from Adam and Eve. It's all a, a continuous uh, line there. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is right here today. This is the Lord's Church. Washington Street Baptist Church in Stephenville is one of many thousands of the Lord's churches in the world today. So this uh, letter, is have, you have no doubt who wrote it, who's the author. When you listen to the very first verse, you'll know that the author is the Lord himself. All of the whole book of Revelation is authored by the Lord. It's the only book that gives total credit to having been given from Jesus Christ to John to write down what we have here. Now, in the book, in verse 18, he said, And unto the angel of the church in Tyre, Tyre, write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like uh, fine brass. So there's no doubt who he's talking to, the angel, he's not talking to some angel that we can't see with our eyes in heaven. He's talking to, the word angel, by the way, again, uh, re, means messenger. 
That's the meaning of the word angel. It's a messenger. So I'm an angel. You're an angel. You give messages for God. That's what an angel is, a messenger. Now there are angels that are created uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ according to John 1, 3 and Colossians 1, 16, 17 that you can't see with your eye unless they, are, they embody themselves some way. But uh, you and I as human beings carrying the message of God, we're angels. Well, this is a particular angel. He's the pastor of the church at Tyra Tyra. This church didn't have a long history. It died out really with a, a war that took place and destroying the church and the, all of the city itself. Uh, not long after it's even started, but the, as far as what it represents in history, this church represents a period from 606 A.D. to 1500 A.D. This church uh, represents what uh, we know in a lot of ways, what we know as the Roman Catholic Church today, even though at the point in time that this was a church, it was not a it was not Roman Catholic, but it represents what we know as Roman Catholicism. And it, it, uh, it's the first year, in fact, 606 A.D. is the first year that they appointed a pope. And that was that year. And as from that period, and there's a lot of things that's gone on in that uh, period of time from 606 to 1500. And, and, and I want to say this to you. I don't know all of you. I don't know... If there's anyone in this in my midst and your background of Catholicism, I'm not hitting on you. I'm just telling you what I'm telling to you. You can go to history and find it for yourself. I didn't make this up. I didn't write it. Have nothing to do with it. But it happened. This is a period of time that these things took place, and they're they are under the control of, of the Roman Catholic Church. And it does have other systems that came out of her uh, that carry on some of these things together. So uh, getting back to the message, though, this is a message from the Lord Jesus Christ giving a fair warning that there's going to be judgment coming. Judgment does not necessarily have to come at the end of time. Sometimes he removes the candlestick. He removes the church in the period of time. He told the church at, at Ephesus, to, you remember that, it had left its first love. He gave them a warning lest they remove the candlestick. In other words, they did stop. They, that church didn't last a long period of time. A little short period, about 30 some years from the time they were like really busy for the Lord and had a great love for the Lord. They had left their first love and, and eventually d totally dissolved. There was no church. And that happens. This church here, Washington Street, 97 years old, as far as our records, what we can determine, still carrying out the work of the Lord the way the Lord wants it carried out. Probably if you listen to each one of these letters, as we read them, we say, well, we need to correct some things because that's the way we learn. God is not pleased with certain things in the church. One of the things he's never pleased with is someone controlling everybody else. This church has been pretty well known to have that kind of a control in it. And God said he's not pleased with the, the Nicolaitans. That's people that rule over the other people. He doesn't want me ruling over you. As I try to point out pretty regular, you have just as straight a line to talk to God as I do as a, as a preacher. There's no one closer to God than God's own people. There's no mediator between God and man except Jesus Christ. So you don't have to pay nobody to get in touch with God or, or bow down to anyone or kiss their big toe or whatever. You just need to get on your knees or whatever position is comfortable for you to talk to the Almighty God and He'll listen to you. He tells us to come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's talking to individuals. He's not talking to just pastors and deacons and Sunday school teachers. He's talking to each individual that has been born into his family, that's been purchased by the precious blood of the Lamb of, of God. So this church, this message is to this church. There's some good things 
uh, written to them. In fact, this church is, uh, has uh, more good things said about it than any of the other six churches. And yet, it's got some problems. Where the one left its first love, this one here, has, and where it would not tolerate certain things in it. Uh, uh, you know, the church at Pergamos had began to kind of have some of them, some of the things in it. This one here is tolerating a lot more. Just, I guess we can use this word as a, it was a, a process of degradation. The church doing good to gradual de declining and uh, accepting things that should not be accepted in the church. Never to accept world, uh, worldliness in, into it. In verse uh, uh, 1, though, he said that the, the author is the Son of God, and he makes this statement, Who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like the, a fine brass. Those are two terms of judgment. Okay, have you ever had anyone to look at you with fiery eyes? <laughs> I had a preacher do that to me one time. I, I was in a... Uh, there's a bunch of preachers, but there's a bunch of other people, and I, I was buying this book that he had authored, and uh, I was trying to pay him, and yet, you know, there's people all around, and I, I guess that seemed a little rude to him, the way I was trying to give him the money and the others talking to him, and he, boy, he gave me, if his eyes could have killed me, I'd have died right there. <laughs> I just stepped back. I mean, they, I thought, oh, you don't want my money now. Right now, I waited my turn. <laughs> Have you ever had anyone to look at you like that? Uh, with fiery eyes? I mean, just about kill you. Mom, maybe, Dad, you ever do you that way? <laughs> I, told, I told someone, one thing about Paula and I, I learned a long time back. That she didn't have to say a word. I could just look at her eyes and tell her what she meant, <laughs> if it's good or bad. Uh, I don't like for anyone to look at me like that, but you know the Lord was actually looking at them, to them like I'm not really pleased. You, you, I'm going to tell you some good things about you, but I'm going to tell you you've got some bad things, some extremely bad things, and I hate them. And uh, he's giving them fair warning in essence as to what he will do. The judgment will come. He's a very patient and caring and loving and kind God. You know, he puts up with a lot. And you'll see in this, he puts up, you may think, well, I'm bad. Hey, you are, you're not bad. You, you think you're bad. This church had a woman that was bad, extremely bad. They called her Jezebel. I don't know if this was the actual name of the woman or they used the term Jezebel from the term in the Old Testament to Jezebel of the Old Testament, who was a Canaanite uh, woman married to Ahab and was the queen of Israel and, and killed the prophets of God. I mean, she was a mean woman, and God's judgment fell on, on her uh, as the warning is here. And the warning is always here for you and me. We know that he's, he has eyes to see everything. He knows every move that we're making. He likes things that we do, and he dislikes some things that we, that we do. And, but he's so patient and so kind and caring and loving and wants us to change on our own and not have to be judged. He says, judge yourself lest you be judged. And so you have a privilege, dear friends, to always judge yourself, confess your own personal sin to God and immediately be completely forgiven of that sin that's separated between you and God. It's caused a uh, a time of breaking of fellowship between you and your Father, which is in uh, heaven. Uh, he said in verse 19, I know, and he says this to every one of these churches, I know, I know a lot of things he's saying. I know this, though, about you. He named six things here. Uh, one of them he double uh, uses twice. He said, I know thy works and charity and the word charity is agape. It's the same word for the word the Bible says, for God so loved the world. It's a love that, sacrificial love. I know your sacrificial love. He said, I know your charity, and I know uh, your uh, service, and your faith, and your patience, 
and the works. He names it again, but he says, and the last to be more than the first. Whatever the works is, up front was good and well worth mentioning by the Son of God. But he said the last works is even more than the first works. So there's six things that he mentions here that's good about this church. And I would like to just give you a free piece of advice right here. If you ever want to really blast somebody for something they've done wrong, first thing to do is mention all the good qualities about them and let them realize they're not all bad. And then you write about the things that you want to give them a piece of your mind, of, so to speak, about. You know, Paul always did that. You read the church, at, uh, the letter to the church at, of Ephesians, to the Ephesians. He wrote three chapters. He wrote six. Three of those chapters were just nothing but how great they were. And their salvation was by grace. And, and on and on. It's nothing but good. And then he starts telling them their things they need to correct. That's always a good policy, by the way, and that's the way he wrote this letter. He gave them good. They're good. This is what you've done. you got good works. You're not all bad. you got some bad in you, but this is where you could be all the time. You could erase all of those things that's in your, in your life, if you would, uh, that's bothering you. And then, uh, of course, it is a letter that's written to the church that makes up, it's made up by individuals that are members of that church. Uh, not all of them are bad. Some of them are, in fact, many of them are really solid Christians. But within the group that makes up the church of Tire Tire, there are some really bad people. And the ones that are good are tolerating, probably sympathetic like we get, to those who are bad. And they're not doing anything about it. And they're not trying to stop it. And we can't have that in the Lord's church. And so they just, they just let it go. And God said, I'm not pleased with it, uh, those things. But he said, and he uses the word service, which I, is a word ministry. It's what I am. I'm a minister. I'm a servant of God. I'm the one that washes your feet. I'm the one that it's the lowest position in the church. Not what a lot of people think. Preachers is elevated uh, above all the people of, of the congregation, but that's false. The preacher is the one that gets down on his knees and washes the feet of the people. He serves the people. It's a position that the Lord Jesus took in the 13th chapter of John when he got down on his knees and washed the people, uh, the disciples' feet. I'm glad I can get to wash your feet. I'm glad I get to be the one that serves you. I don't feel in any form or fashion dominant over you or more powerful than you, even though I know I'm in the hand of God and he protects me himself. And that's a wonderful feeling because I'm too ignorant to fret protect myself. Uh, but he said, they're servant. I know your service. I know your ministry. I know your faith. I don't know why he put faith after works and patient or, or service, I mean, because we're not saved by works, not of works lest any man should boast. We're saved by grace through faith that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. Thank God we don't be in heaven listening to people boast about how the good they were and how they got there. We'll be in heaven boasting about the Lord Jesus himself and how good he was. He said, I know your faith. I know your trust, your confidence. You believe me. And I know also you're, you're patient. You're, you're waiting on things to change at the same time that you're serving. You're patiently serving. Patience is come by tribulation, folks. If you want patience, Tribulation work with patience. The things that happens in your life, God uses to develop you to be patient. Now, if you ever say, God, please make me a very patient person, well, you get ready. You're going to get some tribulation. You're going to get some trials. You're going to have some tests. And God's teaching you what you ask for. So he, he does teach us to be patient. He said, I know you're... 
of patience, and I know those other works, that they're more than the ones that you had at the beginning. Uh, and I don't want to leave anyone tonight, this afternoon, rather, I will, I will be bringing a message on security of our salvation. In other words, once saved, always saved, regardless of the false teachers of the world. The Bible teaches that, and we're saved by grace, not by works. If we're saved by works, I know most of us wound up in hell. How many of us faithful to the Lord? How many of us are actually where God wants us to be, knowing that we're supposed to be there every time? Huh? I mean, we wouldn't make it if it's by works. We're saved by His marvelous grace. It, of course, is the works that He provided, not our works. He said in verse 20, not, notwithstanding, even though you've got a lot of good qualities, I have a few things against thee, he said. Because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess. He said, I didn't, he didn't now, notice the wording. She calls herself a prophetess. God didn't call her. The devil did. He said, she calls herself a prophetess. You allowing her to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat uh, things sacrificed unto idols. You're allowing her, you don't, who's he blaming? The church. Wow. Wonder why he didn't blame the preacher. Because the preacher's not the authority. Who is? The church is the authority. Have you ever heard me? When I'm baptized, when I'm baptized, Sonny, what did I say? I baptized her uh, in the name of the Lord, of the Father and Son, and the Holy Spirit, upon her profession of faith and by the authority of this church. I baptized her in these names. The authority of this church. The church is the authority. The pastor is, is there again and reemphasizing the fact to teach them so that they will do what they're supposed to do in carrying out God's work. You see those missionary letters out there? You know why we're supporting those missionaries? Under the authority of this church. This church votes each time that we choose to support a missionary. I never take one off without the authority of the church. I never put one on without the authority of the church. I may mention there's one. He came, he preached, he brought whatever. But the church is the authority, and the church is the one that made the decision to support or to not support. I like it that way. I believe in congregational uh, con uh, government. And so that way you don't have some person with all their wild ideas uh, trying to tell you what to do. Uh, you got somebody teaching you so you'll know what to do. He said she's, she claimed to be a prophetess herself and she is teaching. Uh, you have to kind of be aware of what's, as far as my responsibility to you, is to make sure that the teachers we have does not teach contrary to what this Bible teaches. In other words, did I just not say we do not believe in a universal church? If a teacher back there is teaching universalism, then that teacher will be removed from their job for teaching contrary to what the Bible's teaching on the church. I think it's 117 times the word church is used, and it's always uh, used in a way that it's a church that you can find in a location somewhere the church at, the church here, the church there, and mis mis scripture twisted is what happens in order to make a universal church out of something. But she's teaching and she's seducing my servants to commit fornication. Now, fornication is any kind of illicit sex there is outside of uh, being married. Maybe homosexualism or maybe just a man and a woman just, well, in my day, they call it shacking up. They don't use that today. That's a bad word. Something else. That's fornication. 
But this is not talking about, and maybe it is too in a way, but it's just talking about spiritual fornication. Spiritual fornication is worse than physical. This woman is teaching them things that to bring them away from God instead of bringing them to God. Impure, immoral uh, things. And maybe the physical side of it does is involved in this. I mean, it can be, because that's what happens in some of the churches. Look at uh, uh, David Koresh and what he was teaching. Remember that? Yes, it's the same. That was illicit sex with somebody else's girls, daughters, or wives. And he was teaching it in the name of the Lord, and they are accepting it. You think people cannot be that ignorant? Let me tell you, they're so, they can get so far away from God, and you read this Bible, they'll burn their babies to mull it. Um, uh, an idol that can't even move itself. You've got to move it. I want you over here. I want you over here. That's an idol. And they'll put their baby in a fire and kill it in the name of the so-called God. That's how far people get away from God. So whenever you're looking at someone that's having a problem and staying with the Lord, don't point your finger at them. Support them. Try to get them up and back to God. Don't support their, the things they're doing wrong. Support them spiritually in a way to bring them back to the Lord so they can have the enjoyable life you're having. In verse, uh, and then in verse 20, she, he says, uh, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I pointed this out last week. There's nothing wrong with eating meat that was bought in a, in a meat market that had been sacrificed to an idol. The idea is that they were actually getting involved in accepting the fact that they could sacrifice this meat to an idol and then eat it. They were actually getting involved with it. Going to the place of uh, where they worship the idol. I don't know. I, I'd have to go back through the book of Corinthians sometime to teach you that, but this is there's a real difference in being on the street looking to buy some meat, and here's a meat market, and you go in and buy it, and that, you don't know that meat just came out of the over here. They didn't need all of it in the, where they worship idols, so they brought it over here. And this guy buys it and sells it to you. There's nothing wrong with it. According to the Corinthian letter, Paul makes that real clear. But it's wrong if you eat it to the idol. I do this in the name of whatever the idol is. Then you're, you're uh, participating in that. And that's what she's teaching. And God was really angry with that. He said in verse 21, you think he's not a loving, caring God? Listen to this. As evil as she is, he said, I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. In other words, space is time. I gave her some time. She had never changed. I've given her time. And I relate this to the Roman Catholic teaching that they give them time. They have had time since 606 A.D. And all their things that they've changed and calling it God giving authority to a man to do these things. My friend, you got to go against this right here to change anything in this church. You'd have to make up your own deal and put it in here somehow and prove it. It's coming out of the Bible. Well, there's a whole lot of things. There's one thing that I detest. It's okay to them to go to Mary instead of Jesus to get to God. That's wrong. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, not the woman that bore his body and brought him into this world. He gave his only begotten son who died on the cross at Calvary. And they think that they can use a woman who is just much of a sinful person as you and me to get to God? No. That's wrong. These holidays that they have is called Halloween and Lent and Easter and Christmas. And we get caught up in those. I don't have anything wrong with Christmas as long as we keep it in 
mind that Christmas is always to be put out that this is a not exact time but represents the time that the Lord came to this earth was born. And Easter, on the other hand, is when he was resurrected from the grave, when he died for the sins of man. But this is not the way it was brought in. These are teachings that's, that's wrong in the, in the Catholicism. You know what he's, what he say about her? Verse 22, I will cast her into a bed and them that commit adultery with her in, into great tribulation except they repent of their deeds. That's a fair warning, isn't it? In verse 23, and I will kill her children. Wait. Wait a minute. God is a God of love, folks. When you listen to some of the preaching that goes on, that's all they think he is. I'm telling you, God hates sin. And if you think you can live in sin and get by with it, you'll find out in a real rugged way one day that God is angry at you for not repenting of your sin and live, confessing it to him. You don't get by with it. When he says to them, not only will I get her and the ones that are committing adultery and fornication with her, well, what does it mean to children? All of those that follow her. There's a following here. He said, I will, listen to what he says. I, I will kill her children with death. What does that mean? When you kill somebody, they're dead anyway. With the death of death. What's he talking about? They'll be cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Oh, but God's a God of love. No, God is a God of love, but God's a God of wrath. My dad was a, was a man that loved his children, but he sure knew how to change that with that old razor strap. <laughs> his also could get pretty wrathful. Hey, let me tell you, God loves you more than you'll ever probably ever recognize in your lifetime, but he loves you, but he will not tolerate your sin. Oh, he's a patient God. Notice this too. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. And all the churches that, that will know, he said. He, talks, he uses the word reins and hearts, which is the total makeup of, of your body. Have you ever heard of someone, they're sick and their kidneys shut down? They die. And really the word reigns here means kidneys. So wow. That's what keeps you going when they're functioning right. In the hearts. Without the heart working, the blood's not circulating. Without the blood circulating is death. So the, the total makeup of, of your body is important here. It's a range of kidneys and the heart. The whole makeup is what he's using here. He said all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth all of the whole makeup of the body. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Read the third chapter of the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, 11th verse down, and it talks about works. Some people are going to have works that will burn. They're wood, hay, and stubble. They only come to church because they had to, not because they wanted to. They had to come. They didn't have the love of God motivating them to come. They had the wrong reasons for being in the house of God. Some people join churches because of their business, to have more business. And that's the wrong reason to go to church. That's, a, that's wood, hay, and stubble. But there's gold, silver, and precious stone. What is that? You can go to church because you love the Lord. You can sing because you love the Lord. You give your tithes offering because of your love for the Lord. It's not because, they, hey, you know, I feel bad. Everybody give. I, I guess I ought to give. No, don't give. Mm -mm. Give when you love the Lord to give, and you'll enjoy it then. Don't be doing anything you do in a grudging manner, ever. That's hypocrisy, and God hates hypocrisy. He puts it on the level of witchcraft. 
and they killed witches. So don't do that. Let God's love motivate you to do anything you do in, this, in the Lord's church, wherever you belong, here or where. And it said in verse 24, But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Tyre, Tyre, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden. In other words, there are people amongst them that held to the faithful things of God. And he said, I know who you are. We get back to the last church, the church of Laodicea, you'll find that Jesus is not even in the church. He's, he's on the outside knocking. And he says, if any man will let me in, I'll come in and sup with him. See, one person. Isn't that amazing? God's willing to come into a place where he's been shut out if there's just one person that opens up their heart to him to come in. I'm talking about his children, not someone to get saved, someone already saved. And they'd invite him back in, and he comes in. He said, I won't put any other of these burdens upon you, but that which you have already hold fast till I come. There's people out here in this world that they're not saved. And you're the only Bible they can read. And what they see in you is what they're going to get. And so he's saying, hold fast to what you already have. Hold fast to your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be seduced by this woman. Don't be uh, weakened by her. Grab hold and hold on with what you got. Not, to, not in order to stay saved, but because you are saved and the world depends on you so that they might even believe. As John 17th chapter, the Lord's Prayer that they might even believe that he came into the world to die for their sins. You hold on. Hold fast to those things uh, till I come, he said. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Oh, wow. I haven't chosen which nation I want to rule over yet. He says he's going to give us... Uh, uh, we're going to have a, a privilege of cooperation with the Lord himself and ruling and reigning over all the, the world. This is dealing with the millennial kingdom, a thousand year reign of Christ on the earth. And you and I will be uh, ruling and reigning with him. And verse 27 says, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a, a potter shall... Shall they be broken to shivers, even as I uh, received of my father? And I will give him the morning star. The morning star is the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to get to be with him. And in the last verse, he that hath an ear. You have an ear? Listen to what it says. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now what is he talking about? Why does he say that? Well, let's go back to the first church. You left your first love. Have we left our first love? Let's go to, to the, to, well, Smyrna, they had no, he didn't rebuke them for anything. It seemed like they were okay. But the church of Pergamos, they were beginning to get a hold of the doctrine of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, which they, uh, things he hated, he said. And then here, they're t letting them teach it. So what do we do? We hear what he's saying to these churches, and we remove those things out of our church so that we'll be right with God. You see what I'm saying? Churches have the privilege of discipline themselves, keeping it clean. And the problem with most of us today is we're too sympathetic with somebody. We don't want to hurt their feelings. We'd rather God whip us than to do what's right. I'm going to ask you to stand, ask the song leader, the uh, instrumentalist come and invite you from right where you are for whatever reason that you may need to come. Maybe you're coming accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior, or maybe you're coming to for prayer, or maybe it's to say, I want to be a part of a church like this.
I know I'm saved by God's grace, been baptized by a Baptist church, and I want to be a part of this one. What page? 244. 